stand is again Sunday at 10 a.m. in the big green, used to be green room in GMCS 333. Review session is Thursday, tomorrow. Uh, I will, we will actually finally get confirmation that it's a boy or girl after being told it was a boy for the last three months, it seems. We'll actually finally have full confirmation, so I might, I'll probably be in a good mood Thursday. Uh, Assuming it's a girl like a name after Dr. Who character, right? It's <laughs> good. Uh, but review session will be in that big gymnasium of a room, assuming it's still open. Uh, that we've got the class to it. Uh, for exam three, uh, as far as chapter 19 is considered, uh, we will go through the aldol reaction. It will be basic aldol. But we'll go through the alcohol and we'll go completely through the Clayson condensation. So study through the alcohol reactions for exam for exam uh, three. So as I said on Monday, uh, chapter 19 continues chapter 18's work with enolates, except instead of an enolate attacking something like I2 or BR2 uh, as the electrophile. In chapter 19, the electrophile is just another carbonate, which is really what chapter 17 dealt with, right? Chapter 17 dealt with nucleophiles attacking carbonyls, different carbonyls on what happens. And so now in chapter 19, it really combines the electrophile carbonyls of chapter 17, and then the nucleophilic properties of carbonyls in chapter 18. So the take-home message of chapter 18, sorry, chapter 19 is uh, enolate attacks a carbonyl, whether, and, you know, if it attacks an ester or an acid chloride, we call that a clasin. And in that case, you actually have something that acts as a leaving group and the electrophilic and the carbonyl that acts as the electrophile. So that leaves, and we'll get our diketone species. Just like if you had a nucleophile attack something with a leaving group in chapter 17, the leaving group would leave, and you get the acyl substitution. So a clasin condensation is just an acyl substitution where the nucleophile is an enolate. That's all the clasic condensation is, and we've been talking about, about that a lot. The aldol reaction is an enolate attacking a ketone or an aldehyde. And in this case, ketones and aldehydes do not have a good leaving group. So the product you get out will be an alcohol. So the electrophilic <coughs> ketone that's attacked by the nucleophilic enolate will end up being a alcohol. And we'll talk about that more. But just to try to put it in perspective, students always think this is a big jump, a big leap going into this chapter, and everything's completely different, and it's so hard. But it really isn't. It's just replacing things we've studied in you know, pretty much the entire class with enolates as a nucleophile. And so nothing really changes. It's just a nucleophile that's carbon-based instead of heteroatom-based. Uh, so just keep that in mind. So the first reaction is the Clayson rearrangement. And uh, this example is what we call a homoclasin. We call it a homoclasin because it's between two uh, ketones that are the same, right? This, uh, both of these, I believe it's ethyl propionate. So these are the same molecule. I just drew one in a different color just so it'll be easier to follow. So in the clasin, uh, the standard conditions uh, for a homoclasin is sodium methoxide and ethanol. And these are thermodynamic conditions. So basically what's going to happen is the sodium methoxide is going to act as a base. And let me do the color in the arrow in a different color so it's easier to follow.
The sodium with oxides can act as a base, eventually forming our enolate. So in this case, we're dealing with an ester because it's a clasin. So we don't have to worry about thermodynamic versus kinetic because there's only one choice. Uh, when we talk about aldols, and we're starting to use ketones, and that can change a bit, and then we have to worry about thermodynamic versus kinetic. But for the clasin, we're pretty much home free. So we form the enolate, really the only enolate, enolate you can form. <coughs> and then the key step, and I'll draw this arrow in red, is the enolate attacking another equivalent of itself for the homo, for the homo uh, place in. It's going to attack another equivalent of itself in non-pronated form. So it's an enolate attacking an, an ester. <coughs> and so what that will give us will be now a tetrahedral intermediate. tetrahedral intermediate from this nucleophilic carbon and the enolate attacking the blue carbonyl. Yes? Why is it the thermodynamic product? Well, because there's, there's, it's neither, right? There's no possibility for kinetic or thermodynamics because there's only one hydrogen. There's only one alpha carbon of hydrogens. Because okay. the ester blocks off the other. Exactly. So I, I was just pointing out that with esters, we don't have to worry about kinetics versus thermodynamics. So it gets a little bit simpler. So we get our tetrahedral intermediate, and of course this can go backwards. The key thing about the clasin, and this is, gonna, this is actually a really key point, I'll point out again in a second, is every step in the clasin, highly reversible, until the very last step. So I hope you've seen in everything we've done, you know, there's not that, you know, there's only a small pKa driving force. So you know, an enolate with a pKa of 24. Attacking a carbonyl, we have an alcohol with a pKa of 16. So yeah, that's a sizable pKa difference. But there's no reason, and I'll do this in orange. <coughs> Once we form this, this is a tetrahedral intermediate, but it's something where we can actually kick off an ester, hypothetically, to give us back to an enolate our starting materials. So this step where it will favor this step thermodynamically, there's no reason it can't go back to give us our starting materials. And this will become key in a second. And so my forward arrows I'll just do in blue. So the orange arrows are going backwards. So I say retroclasin in orange, which is the reverse clasin. Those arrows are in orange, and the forward arrows are in blue. But let me erase the orange arrows for now. I was getting perhaps to stop ahead of myself to a point. All right, so in the forward placing, the next step now is now the tetrahedral intermediate collapsing, where we kick off uh, OET minus. So forward placing, enolate attacks, tetrahedral intermediate forms. We kick off sodium with oxide as a relieving group. Great. So that gives us what the most, that gives us this thing that's the product. But the most common mistake made in this exam is people are going to stop here. You notice I just didn't draw this arrow going up to the product. I'm just drawing the product in this form. So that means the mechanism doesn't end when you form the product for the very first time. All right. 
So why, even though this is the product, why does the mechanism not end here? Yeah? Nice. Exactly. So remember, we're doing this under basic conditions. And in the product, we come up with a hydrogen that's now alpha to two carbonyls instead of one, which means it's much more acidic than the starting material under, under basic conditions. And so then what happens, and this is actually a thermodynamic driving force. This is the reason this reaction works. is because, so that will form carboxylic acid, giving us the carboxylate, which is a thermodynamic uh, resting place of the saponification reaction. And so that's a product we get out until we add an acid to get the carboxylic acid out. We talked about this reaction a little bit last week. We talked about this before spring break. I've said several times, saponification is a key mechanism for this clux. But the driving force of saponification is the deprotonation of the carboxylic acid to get the carboxylate giving us an unreactive carboxylate. Well, this is kind of the same idea. Once we form uh, this enolate here, it's, a, it's unreactive. There's no acidic protons. Uh, since there's a net minus charge on this carbonyl, uh, none of the ketones are more, not, none of the carbonyls are reactive so that another equivalent enolate can't add into it. Because now since there's a nat minus charge, the high star orbitals are less reactive than a, a reagent of starting material. And I'll, I'll illustrate this in a second. But the key thing that I want to point out is this is the key step that actually forms, is this enolate, which is the thermodynamic uh, resting place. And then you finish the reaction by adding some H3O to protonate. Thinking of it to give us a product. So I'm, I'm going to push this over here and I'm going to really try to illustrate why, if this reaction forms, if, if, if this hydrogen did not be protonated, things just stick. So 
So if we take two equivalents of this isopropyl ester, one in blue and one outlined in orange, the placing product would come from the enolate here, this carbon, after it's, well, let me do the mechanism just because it's still a new reaction for you guys. So orange, orange. So if you were to take these two, we would form the enolate of one of them, doesn't matter which one. And then the enolate would go and attack the other carbonyl. Give us a tetrahedral intermediate, which would quickly collapse, kicking off the ethyl to give us this. All right, now I'm going to draw the tetrahedral intermediate. <laughs> just to really uh, make it clear. So from this enolate attack and this carbonyl, here's our tetrahedral intermediate, which can then collapse to give us a clase product. So again, another example of this mechanism. But the major difference in this case is we have two methyl groups here. So we can't form, we don't have the acidic hydrogen. We still have this hydrogen, which is a pKa of 20 to 24, 20 to 24. But this acidic hydrogen, it doesn't exist because there's two methyl groups. Uh, whereas, in this case, we do have the acidic hydrogens between the two carbonyls. So what does the lack of this hydrogen mean? Well, obviously it means it can't be deprotonated. And if it can't be deprotonated, you don't form this similar dynamic sink. And so what that means, basically, is I said every, I said every step in the glycine is really, really reversible, right? So that, that means what can happen, and even this step is really reversible, and so what that means, what can happen if you, if you cannot form that deprotonated intermediate is we can just have the sodium ethoxide that's swimming around because we're doing this in sodium ethoxide attack this to go back to this intermediate, which we go forward to the product, or it go backwards to the start, or it go backwards to the enolate and then all the way back to the starting chips. And so when we don't have this acidic proton in the product like we do in a typical place in, the reaction is never going to be thermodynamically driven forward. It's going to be going forward and going backwards. It's going to be going forward and going backwards. It's, it's just going to be some mixture of starting material and product that will never go to full conversion under typical conditions. Whereas if you have an acidic hydrogen, then between two carbonyls, then it can be deprotonated, giving us this, and then this will be a thermodynamic driving force, pushing it to the product. Whereas in this case, it's just stuck in limbo. It's going forward, going backwards, going forward, going backwards. And then, furthermore, there's another issue that these non deprotonated products form. And that is, this is still an ester, right? And we still have enolate being formed from the starting material. So why couldn't, in a, you know, why couldn't instead of this attacking this, why couldn't this 
attack the product and give us a triclase or, or a tetraclase. Yeah, and since there's no alpha hydrogen, it can do that. Since there's no alpha hydrogen, it can do this. So this is just going to be equally reactive as an electrophile to the enolate nucleophile. And so the other issue with not being able to form this thermodynamic sink product is that the product's still going to be as reactive as an electrophile as the starting material is. So now then this itself can add into here as a new, as an, using this as an electrophile, giving us a, a look at the product. Yes? So the ketone enolates are actually bad nuclear products? Yeah, they're 10 orders of magnitude less nucleophilic. Remember, because they're more stabilized. OK, but could any electrophile add into there? Like, is there any other pathway you can get out of that thermodynamic sink, or is that just basically the end? Yeah, so they're less nucleophilic, so they're not going to add as quickly. Uh, but also, uh, this deprotonation is going to happen almost instantaneously, right? So once you form the product, it's going to form. So it's not going to have a chance to act <coughs> as a uh, electrophile. So only the starting material can act as the electrophile. And then you might say, well, yes, but this is still a mean, like, can it act as a nucleophile? And it's 10 orders of magnitude less reactive than uh, less nucleophilic because it's more stabilized. It's, its pKa is 10 orders of magnitude lower than the starting material. And so that means the starting material is going to react 10 orders of magnitude faster than this one. So even though it could, in theory, act as a nucleophile, it's going to be so much more stabilized, i.e. less reactive, it won't have a chance. The starting material will, will do it. But you won't have the starting material left. Well, so, the, yes, but the problem you're worried about, so, reactions occur over time, right? The first 30% of molecules will form this, and there will still be plenty of okay. starting material left. And that's where the problems happen. And so this, this will be deprotonated before it can react with any starting material that still hasn't reacted yet up with. So, so the ability to be deprotonated does two things. One, it drives the reaction thermodynamically to the product. And two, it almost protects the product from further reaction. Protects the product from further reaction. So just to give you an example that you might see in an exam, uh, you know, I might say, all right, two equivalents of this under glacial conditions will give you this product if I don't say H3O, and this product if I say H3O, right? So the classic kind of question I like to ask. Uh, however, if in part B I say, all right, now two equivalents of these esters that now form the product that can't be deprotonated, the answer would be, uh, you know, either no reaction or reaction does not work, or this is a really messy reaction because there's no thermodynamic driving force. I'd personally be fine with no reaction or lousy reaction. Something that denotes that the chemistry isn't working very well because there's no thermodynamic driving force at all. Yeah? And the thermodynamic driving force is the uh, alpha? Yeah, yeah, it's the forming the acidic hydrogen under basic conditions. Again, this acidic hydrogen between two carbonyls about 10 to 12. And so, since we're under uh, basic conditions of TKA 16 or so, this hydrogen will almost instantaneously be deprotonated to give us this. And so this deprotonation event is the thermodynamic driving force. Just like in the saponification mechanism going from a methyl ester to a carboxylic acid, the thermodynamic driving force is the base adds into the ester, kicks out water, giving us our carboxylic acid under basic conditions, which is quickly deprotonated. So that quick deprotonation drives forward the, the uh, saponification mechanism. Whereas in this case, this quick deprotonation drives forward the placement. 
Yeah. So as long as there's alpha hydrogen it's still there, it'll just keep going. Yeah, as long as the alpha hydrogens are fine, you're going. Uh, so you, you can also do internal molecular equations. Internal molecular equations work well. So if I give you an intermolecular equation, the way you want to work, out, work on it is you want to assign numbers to your carbons. simple case because it's symmetrical. And so regardless of which one is X, you're going to get the same product. But you just want to be careful. And so what I would do is I would decide which, which carbonyl do I want to act, attack as my electrophile. And you just set a line. So this is symmetrical, so it doesn't matter. So let's make this the one carbon for our electrophile. Then we'll go two, three, four, five, and then we know that since if, if this is going to be our electrophilic ester, this is going to be our nucleophilic, so we know we'll make the enolate here. That's better. And so then, you know, mechanistically, it becomes a little more tractable in that now we can say, all right, we decided this one's going to be our enolate. So let's have our sodium methoxide. Grab a proton. And let's continue with the numbering so we don't get confused. And then we can do our next placing step. Which is going to be our nucleophilic enolate carbon 5, attacking our electrophilic ester carbon 1. Now it gets to the hard part. part. Now we have to draw the product. Uh, sorry, the, uh, the tetrahedral intermediate. Uh, what, how, how large of a ring is it going to be? Cyclo, this is going to be a cyclopentane, a cyclohexane, a cyclopentane, right? Five membered, one, two, three, four, five. And so then we can make our lives easier. Because if we can do anything, we can draw a pentagon, right? I, I have to be careful. I, would, I almost said pentagram. I'm like, that doesn't come out of <laughs> So in that case, then we can just draw our five-membered ring. Let's number the carbons. And so if we made this carbon one, we know this will be the carbon that was attacked, so we'll have our tetrahedral intermediate at that carbon. Like so. And if this is carbon 5, we you know carbon 5 is attached to the carbon oxygen bond, which should now be, since this was an elate and an attack, we you know it's going to be back to a carbon yield. So we can now just draw it like so. Then we can draw the collapse of our tetrahedral intermediate.
giving us our product. And luckily, we have now an alpha hydrogen that's between two carbon nails, so it's got a pKa of about 10 to 12. So under these conditions, basic conditions, sodium oxide, pKa 16, rather than this adding into here and giving us our intermediate back in the retro placement, which could happen if we didn't decarbonate it, this can grab the proton. giving us our thermodynamic sink. Well, be this guy. Uh, they, I do something. Esther, Esther. Uh, that was. Yeah, that should be yesterday. What's up? It should be methanol instead of ethanol. 
Well, yeah, again, didn't need that semantics. But yes, let's go, methanol. So anyway, pretty much what's <laughs> happening here is we're going to do a retro, so this doesn't have a hydrogen, right? So we can't deburnate it. So we're going to do a retro clasin to get to here. And so one way to think of this is we're going to break this bond, right? instead of kicking out methanol to go back to the product, we can actually kick off, we can actually break this bond. And I'll draw it into this black. And after we have this bond, go into enolate to give us this. So it's a retroplacing. A retroplacing, and I've said it several times in this lecture, Clasins can go backwards. They can go forward to give you a clasin product, or they can go backwards to give you an enolate and an ester. And so in this case, where this goes to this, all that's happening is first step is we're going to have a retro clasin to give us the enolate and the product. And of course, we're in, we're in methanol and sodium methoxide. So there's lots of methanol around. And so the methanol can just pronate the senolate. Like so. under basic conditions, so now we can form a different enolate. So instead of the enolate based on this ester being depronated, we can form the enolate based on this ester being depronated. Number 
with a ketone. Well, I got some tetrahedral intermediate. And then so since this carbon attacked, we'll have a methyl ester here. Pick up the methyl ester. They give us this product. But of course, this product's got something special with it, right? What does this product have that the starting material doesn't? It's got a proton that can be deprotonated. So if we form this, get an orange so it's clear. We can deprotonate this proton to give us the thermodynamic kiss. Could you um, number the... I, I will. Okay. Once I uh, draw this, I'll number everything for you guys. Because this, is, because this has enough hydrogen, it can be deprotonated. So let's start from the beginning and go through this mechanism again, and I'll number everything. So one, two, three, four, five. And in this case, it will be one, two, three, four, five. So the first step is methanol adding in to give us a tetrahedral intermediate, which gives us a retroplacid that breaks the bond between one and five. Then the methanol protonates the enolate. Again, that's definitely PKA favored. So the enolate on carbon five is protonated. And then the base in turn deprotonates carbon two to form the enolate at carbon two. Now the enolate on carbon two can attack the ester that does not have the number because it was outside of the ring to begin with. So one, two, three, four, five. So now the carbon in the ring is no longer numbered. Yes. Where this are step? the arrows going? This is just these, these arrows. 
No, like the next step. Where's the next oh. step? Is that better? And then what's the one underneath it? Well, this is, we have proton that's really acidic. Oh, and we're under basic conditions, so this can be quickly deprotonated. And this deprotonation is the driving force of the reaction. This is one of the most complex placements you can get. But it's not that hard. You just have to realize placements can do retro placements, and then we'll equilibrate into the more thermodynamically stable product, which is the one that's got an alpha hydrogen. Yes? Can you number the carbons on that product? Uh, of course, of course. Okay. So once again, the help point, so the first examples I gave you were pretty straightforward, right? And then this one kind of took it up a notch. But this Clayson question tests everything about thermodynamic Clayson rearrangements. The key thing is they can go backwards. And if they can go backwards and give you a more stable product, they will. And so if there's nothing outside of a typical place in retro place in this mechanism, I swear. It's just you have to think about what's more stable, what's going to drive a force. Yes? Concerning the intermediate, the driving force for it not like form a double bond, you can take off the metal, speaking of the again. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's both a thermodynamic, so it's more stable. It can't be intact itself, but also the the KEQ of that deep rotation is going to be like ten to the ten, and so that's really going to push it to the product. And so, in other words, if we start up with something like this, and we fill in some base and acid, it can open up and it'll give you a more thermodynamically stable product. And the reason it's more thermodynamically stable is because it has an acidic hydrogen. That's the idea of the glacier. You need an acidic hydrogen. Yes? So here, yeah. this is just the, uh, the product. Oh, that's the metal. That's the metal. If you understand this, you understand the glacier.